<laughs> because it was so utterly fascinating. It's like studying a group of people. They can live to be 70 years old. They're all different. They have their individual personalities. And it's like, you know, a whole history of a community unraveling before your eyes and you just solve one, answer one question and another one pops up. And, you know, it's just totally fascinating. They are unbelievably similar, uh, actually too similar. I used to think they were like us but nicer, but they have the same dark side that we do. But I mean, the DNA, 98% shared. David Greybeard and Flo. The first one. Yeah. Well, they might, they remind me of the early days, which were the best days ever, because everything was new and it was just me, me and the forest alone. It was like being in heaven. The story that comes to your mind. But the story that's coming to my mind is when I thought I'd lost David Greybeard. He'd just begun to allow me to actually follow him, you know. And before that, I never did. And. I thought I'd lost him, and then I found him sitting, looking back down the trail, looked just as if he was waiting for me. And so I sat down near him, and there was this lovely red palm nut on the ground, and I offered it to him, and he turned his face away, and I put my hand closer, and he reached out and took the nut and dropped it. He really didn't want it, and very gently squeezed my hand, reassurance, which is how you know, I knew that he understood my motive was good even though he didn't want the nut. So we understood each other totally in a language that obviously predates words. And it's almost the way he rejected that nut. I was thinking about that the other day. It's like this awful oil palm industry that's destroying the forests of Asia, now Africa and Latin America. And it's, you know, David rejecting the nut has become kind of in my mind symbolic. I think I watch them differently. I see little chimpy behaviors. You know, I like watching people. I like watching people meet and if they don't know each other and how that goes. And I think I watch probably more closely now. I, I do, and I watch. You know, I watch human behavior for a reason. Like I very quickly realized that if you start arguing with someone, if you have different opinions. If you argue in a slightly aggressive way, the other person stops listening to you because they're so busy wanting to refute your argument that they don't listen anymore. So the only way to change people is to get in here. One is real poverty. Because when you're really poor, you're going to cut down the last trees, not because you don't understand, but because you've got to grow food and you've, over, you've used, overused the, the soil. Yeah. In, so that it's infertile. Um, you'll cut down a tree to grow crops, you'll cut down a tree to make charcoal, to make some kind of livelihood. Um, if you're living in a city, you'll buy the cheapest goods, even though they were made in an environmentally unfriendly way because you can't afford anything else. So abject poverty is one huge problem. Unsustainable lifestyles, probably every one of us in this room, including me, we have to learn to do with less which means changing the entire economy of a country. Because at the moment, if a country starts going into recession, what does the government say? Buy. You've got to buy to support your country, to be you know, a good national. So somehow, the, 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 the um, thinking behind the fact that we can have unlimited economic growth on a planet with limited um, natural resources is stupid. Something has to change. And then finally, human population growth. Those three things together cause everything else, whether it's climate change or desertification, you know. It's, it's so those underlying, those three, three things underlie everything else. We have to change them, that's why we work so much with children, because children change their parents better than I can. And they're going to grow up to be the next parents, the next teachers, the next lawyers, the next politicians. Is that where your hope lies? My biggest hope. The other hopes are this brain that we have. If we, if we link it to the heart, then we can achieve our full human potential and our brain is capable of magic. Um, the main lesson, the chimps helped me to teach people 
is that animals like us have personalities, minds and feelings, which is what I was told wasn't true when I first went to Cambridge. That was unique to us, I was told. Same as tool making. And I shouldn't have given them names, they should have had numbers. I mean, I learned all that from my dog, long before I met the chimps. But the chimps were the ones, because they're so like us, that enabled me to share that with people. That's the difference. I think we can learn a lot about reconciliation after aggression, because a chimpanzee, um, sometimes indeed, the fight is so bad that the loser will go away. But basically, uh, after an argument or you know conflict, then the loser will come up and is desperate for a reassuring touch, a hug, a pat, and then social harmony is restored. <laughs>